Welcome to the business case for employment background checks. I'm Mike Coffey, president of Imperative Information Group. We're a background screening firm based in Fort Worth. Uh, we've been in business 16 years now, and I'm privileged to have the ability to work for a whole bunch of smart companies all over the country. Um, my background is HR. I've been in and around HR for most of my career. I'm past president of Fort Worth HR, and I work with the Texas SHRM State Council, Texas SHRM. I'm also on the board of the Texas Association of Business and have a lot of other uh, affiliations as well. But the real thing you need to know is that, I, I, like I said, I have a lot of really smart clients who I've got, had the privilege to work with over the, the last 16 years and help them solve all kinds of problems related to employee selection and uh, employee relations issues. And along the way, we've learned a lot. And so I want to share some of that today. And some of that is going to be the gospel according to coffee, my own um, take on different issues. Probably less so in this webinar than in some of the other deeper dive webinars that get into other topics. And we'll talk about some of those as we, we go along. When I was in healthcare human resources, you know, even back in the 90s and before that in aerospace, um, we always did pretty good background checks for obvious reasons. But for many employers, a background check was just really a piece of paper in the file. They had that understanding that if they uh, did some due diligence on the front end on the hiring process, that that, you know, that piece of paper in the file would protect them if this employee did something dumb down the road. Now, the reality is, is Often that wasn't the case because the courts did expect employers to, you know, to have done their, some real due diligence and to know what could be reasonably known. And um, so if they weren't really doing a real, you know, thoughtful background check, they often uh, would be found liable. But then 9-11 happened. And we had been in business a couple of years when 9-11 happened. And... Um, we saw just a real surge of interest from employers, even those who weren't, you know, involved in any area that might have been governed by the Patriot Act or anything like that. Employers began to realize that the people that they give access to their companies had, could have a significant impact on them, and I think the whole nation was just a lot more focused on on doing better due diligence. And then, of course. We had all the corporate scandals in the early nine, in the early 2000s, including those related to Enron, Global Crossing, Mark, and those kind of groups. And the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was passed, and that created a, uh, a new level of responsibility for employers to make sure that the people who were in corporate governance um, were who they said they were and that they acted in an ethical way. And so the due diligence on board members and executives became a, a lot larger priority than it had been for a lot of employers. Now, the truth is, though, you're unlikely to hire a terrorist. You're unlikely to hire some corporate fraudster like Ken Lay or Jeff Skilling. But one in four adults has some sort of arrest or conviction records. That doesn't mean that one in four adults is unemployable, but it means that one in four adults has been caught making some sort of bad decision that violated the law. And you as an employer uh, need to know what those um, decisions were and have that information so that you can evaluate the risks somebody may pose by being in a particular role. We think about security and you automatically often think about outside threats coming into your workplace. But the reality is, is that you have a lot of threats inside that come from inside your own workforce, the people that you're bringing in to interact with your employees, uh, your customers to handle your accounts. Those are all um, internal threats that uh, that you know a good due diligence process can help mitigate. And of course, uh, you are as an employer liable for the behavior of your employees. 
and that can be financial liability. It can also be uh, the liability of goodwill. The, you know, often when there's an incident uh, related to a workplace that makes the news coverage, people remember years later that was the pl business where this thing happened. And even if the employer was was you know was found not responsible in a civil case or you know whatever happened, people don't remember all those details. But what they do remember is that this is where those things happened. And so um, your the goodwill that your company's brand engen engenders in, in other people uh, can be be radically injured and you know maybe irreparably. Uh, irreparable, irreparable, without repair, <laughs> injured, okay? Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, the number one source of shrink, of things that walk out of the retail environment without being paid for, is employee theft. That's more than um, shoplifting, it's more than vendor fraud, anything like that. The number one source of stuff walking out of the door without being paid for is employee theft. So the more you know about their employees' past honesty, is predictive of how they uh, will, will behave in your behavior. The other side of that story is once they're in your organization, they may have issues that would lead you to question their continued suitability for a certain role. And this is Stephen Robertson. Uh, he was hired as the network administrator for Cinemark, the national movie chain. Uh, while he was working for Cinemark, a case was filed against him in, in Dallas County for illegally accessing and damaging the computer network of one of his former employers. He went in and you know, stopped some network services and left taunting messages to the guy who took his place at that employer. He ended up receiving five years probation while he was working at Cinemark for illegal access in the computer network, and he, in Cinemark, apparently never became aware of it. Uh, and so he continued as the network administrator for Cinemark. Well, ultimately, down the road, Cinemark uh, ended their relationship with him, and he was terminated. And... Uh, at that point, he uh, illegally accessed Cinemark's computer systems and deleted files, including a 60 gigabyte PeopleSoft database. He also stopped several of their network services. So you can imagine being HR and coming in on a Monday morning and PeopleSoft is gone. So uh, on that one, the feds got involved and he ended up with 41 months in federal prison and three years of supervised release. And so had Cinemark realized that, hey, we have somebody working for us who's got this giant red flag and who's probably an insider threat. They might have taken uh, more advanced precautions before they terminated him. And they probably certainly wouldn't have continued to let him have network access uh, from the moment they found out. So why do you even care about somebody's background, whether it's their criminal history or their employment history or whatever. Why does that even matter? Why not just hire them strictly based on their resume, what their claims are? Well, the idea is that past behavior predicts future behavior. That's what behavioral event interviewing is all about, right? Um, we, uh, we ask questions, ask that employees to tell us about a time, or the applicants to tell us about a time when you, you know, solved a problem working inside of a group or when you led a group to solve a problem and then you keep digging deeper and deeper to get into the core behaviors that that person exhibited while, um, you know, completing that task or achieving that goal. That's the same thing that we use employment, or we use background check information for. Um, you wouldn't want the guy on the left uh, driving the forklift in your mun munitions warehouse, right? It just it wouldn't be a good fit. And so there's certain, you know, that's a bomb on the right, by the way. Actually, it's a bomb on the left too. But 
this is prob this is not probably who you want in that role. And so there are times where we would exclude somebody strictly because of the nature of their offense and how recent it was, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But also there are other times where it's you won't use criminal history or even you know previous employment history or things like that as an exclusionary tool. But what you will do is use it to help evaluate applicant A versus applicant B. If you've got multiple applicants for a job and one guy has a criminal history that's fairly recent and maybe it's not even something that would exclude them from consideration for the job, but it, it, you know, it's a whole series of little knucklehead uh, things like uh, driving while license suspended and maybe uh, disorderly conduct and maybe a theft by check, a whole bunch of just dumb little things that in and of themselves may not exclude the person. But when you compare that person to a candidate who's, you know, similar skills and background, except that this other candidate doesn't have all these little red flags about their decision-making ability and their compliance with uh, established rules and procedures, who's going to be the easier candidate to manage? Well, obviously, the guy who's, you know, who doesn't have all these little red flags is, is, is a better bet for you. And uh, a lot of employers are going to, should make their decisions based on the whole applicant. And so when you're looking at the whole applicant, part of their, uh, part of their history is how they've performed with other employers, what their criminal history says, those kinds of matters. This stuff does matter. And we've all, we all know this. It's all, you know, if you've been in HR for very long and you, especially if you've been managing people, hiring and firing, you know that we often hire for skills, but we ultimately fire for behavior. So why wouldn't we look at you know, their past behavior in making a decision about their future, uh, what their future behavior may look like in our environment? The cost of bad hires. There are all kinds of numbers out there. The more conservative number is from the U.S. Department of Labor that says that the replacement cost of an employee is 150% of the employee's salary. And that's just the replacement cost. It doesn't factor in the money that you wasted uh, while you were recruiting and onboarding and training that employee. Uh, whatever compensation you wasted while they were not productive while you're trying to bring them up to, to speed or the cost of, of managing them out of the organization. And then also then measure the cost of the organization on morale, productivity, lost business opportunities, all those kinds of things. Um, there is also an estimate out there that's in the notes that I'll send everybody um, that says that the cost of a bad $62,000 salary manager um, is uh, about $840,000 when you include all the, all the costs and lost opportunities. So those numbers are all over the place, but the truth is, is we all know that when you get hold of the wrong person in the wrong role, it is expensive, it's time consuming, and it's a distraction to the person the, who has to manage that person and to their, their colleagues and coworkers. We've got a whole bunch of stories like the Stephen Robertson story at badhiredays.com. It's true stories about individuals uh, who were hired without the employer probably understanding who they were hiring and what they did to those employers. So badhiredays.com is always a kind of a fun read, I hope. So what goes into a background check? Let's get into how you make the sausage because there's there are a lot of misconceptions out there, and I, I speak to employers daily. I speak to at conferences, and um, and I've got so many clients, and we bring we're bringing new clients in all the time. So there are a lot of misconceptions, and and I want to we'll go through the the reasons for some of those misconceptions and help you understand, you know, you can make a better decision and a better business case for actually running background checks if you understand what, what, what your options are and what really goes into a background check. So it really needs to start with identity research. The first thing that your background screening partner should be doing is taking the information that the applicant has provided and bouncing that information against a database. 
Um, you may know these, depending on who your background screening partner is, you may know these as uh, social security number traces, social security number research. We call it at imperative, we call it identity research. And what it does, it takes the information that the applicant gave you and bounces it against a database that's got the records from a couple credit bureaus and a whole bunch of other consumer reference files. You've heard discussions out there about big data and how these big data companies are collecting all this information about us. Well, this is part of that. But what it's really good for is it gives us a really pretty uh, useful list of names that have been associated with that person's social security number and the address history that person's uh, used. And so the reason those, those two things are important is, first of all, the names are important because all your criminal records out there are indexed under uh, names. So in, if I walk into a courthouse to check criminal records, I can't just punch in a social security number and get all the records. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. I need to know what those people's, what names have been associated with those people. So we may see Betty Jones as our applicant, but when we run this database, we see, oh, well, she's also used the name Betty Smith. That must be a previous married or maiden name. Or we'll, well, our, our applicant may be uh, uh, Richard Coffey, but he, uh, when, we, when we run this database, we see that actually his first name is really John, and, and so, and he's got, he's used both John and Richard as a first name interchangeably. So we need to make sure we do our research under John and Richard. And you may also see things where names are spelled differently. Um, you know, I'm down here in Texas, and we see Gonzales a lot. And sometimes Gonzales ends with a Z, and sometimes it ends with an S. Well, some court record systems are set up so that when you type in a name, it only gives you the exact name match. So you, if you search for, for Gonzalez with a Z, you won't find Gonzalez with an S. So we need to know if that's how they, they've used it in the past and, and look for any names that they've searched so we can do our research as thoroughly as possible. Now, on occasion, you're going to get somebody who has uh, you know, no records in the consumer reference files. And we see this primarily with people who are young kids, 19, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they've never established credit, and they don't have a, you know, they just haven't left a, much of a financial footprint behind them, and so they don't, they don't have any records in there. Um, we also see it with people, recent immigrants, who have uh, a valid Social Security number. They just haven't established credit and, and built up their, their credit profile, so they don't show up in these consumer reference files. And in those cases, what we can do is go to have the applicant complete a second form and to uh, go straight to the Social Security Administration and verify with the Social Security Administration that at, the, at a minimum that this name, date of birth, um, and Social Security number all match the records from the, uh, in the Social Security Administration's uh, records. We can do this pre-hire if the applicant signs the appropriate paperwork. Another great way to verify uh, somebody's identity early on in the screening process is to run a driving record on them. We think about driving records primarily where you're, you've got somebody who's going to operate a motor vehicle or heavy equipment or some sort of equipment that requires a high level of safety awareness. And so, but also driving records are great as a source for verifying that this name date of birth and address that the applicant gave you all matches the records in, in, the, uh, in the state government's uh, driving record and in, in, in the driver's license files. And of course, from there, we want to verify that the person's claims about their fitness for the job are accurate. So we want to verify their education claims, their employment history, any licenses or certifications that they have. Now, this is a really big area of fraud, uh, especially the education area. We see a lot of employers uh, or applicants who have made up uh, whole employment histories. And uh, 
and education histories. And so they'll say they went to the University of Texas and uh, claim a, a bachelor's. And they may have had successful employment previously, but they're lying on their application because they never really did go to UT. Or maybe they went to UT, but they didn't graduate and they're claiming a degree. We see a ton of that. There are also degree mills out there. And these degree mills, what they do is you pay them $500, and then they will verify for anybody who calls that you have a degree. And they sound, they've got, a web, they've got websites, and they look like they're legitimate in, uh, entities. They, they look like, uh, you know, they've got pictures of these rolling, you know, green hills around their campus, and co-eds, and volleyball, and whatever. It looks like a real school from their website, and then you call them, and the registrar's office answers, and it sounds very professional, and they say, yes, Jim Bob had a degree. He graduated in whatever year Jim asked him to, to say. So it looks 100% legit. And uh, what happens, though, at the end of the day is that the, um, the whole thing is a fake, and the employer doesn't have uh, – you know, doesn't have a clue that this guy doesn't have the degree uh, that he claimed. And so we see that a fair amount. And um, so you have to be really aware to make sure that these schools that, that your applicants went to are truly accredited, that they exist, that they've been accredited by a recognized accrediting body. In Texas, as a matter of fact, it's a crime to apply for work using a, deg a degree mill but uh, we still catch it every day. And uh, employment, there are also there. You know, we often have people who claim that they worked at XYZ company, but when we call that company, they've never heard of them. Or they get really tricky, and they will give us the name of a uh, a friend and say this person was my supervisor, and they'll give us the friend's cell phone number. So when we call, we call, we get a cell phone number. And we talk to this friend, and, oh, yeah, he was a great guy and all this, but we can hear, you know, family feud or whatever going on in the background while he's talking to us. And so we know something's weird. So we look up that actual employer and call the employer directly. And often they've never heard of our applicant or his friend who said he was his former supervisor. So those are the kinds of uh, issues that, that we often find when we're, we're trying to do verifications like that. Now, you can get credit for employment purposes without a score. The uh, credit that you get is a regular credit report. It just doesn't have a score because the, the FICO scores, your credit scores, were de designed in order to evaluate your ability to repay a debt, which obviously has nothing to do with your employability. And um, so what you get is a credit, should, what you should be getting anyway, is a credit report without a score. If you are seeing a score, and this happens primarily at financial institutions that we talk to, they say, well, we get a credit score on every report, on every applicant. And what's happening, and if you're a financial institution, you probably want to check this, is you know, because they're already set up for credit reports, uh, for their own loan underwriting purposes, somebody in HR just walks over to underwriting and says, hey, can you run this credit report on this applicant? And they run it for them, but they're not changing their permissible purpose codes, and uh, so they're running a credit report which imp uh, a credit report with a score which impacts that person's credit score every time an inquiry is made, whereas an employment inquiry doesn't affect the score, but what you'll get on the score credit report is just what you see on yours. Uh, accounts that the people have used, um, their payment histories, uh, you'll see some, you know, maybe liens or judgments that have been filed with the credit bureau, uh, collection accounts, all kinds of stuff. Now, the reason employers often want to see credit reports are, you know, they'll tell me things like, well, he's going to handle cash, and we just want to make sure he's... Uh, uh, he's safe and he's not going to steal any money from us. Unfortunately, the, the credit report is probably not your best barometer of that. I spend a lot of time trying to talk employers out of running credit reports because, quite honestly, um, the few studies that are out there say there's no correlation between integrity and honesty and uh, a negative credit history. So just because somebody's credit's negative doesn't mean that they're not 
a uh, honest employee. You know, think about what you see on, you know, the circumstances you hear about with people with negative credit. Well, maybe they were unemployed for a period of time. Maybe a spouse lost their job, and or maybe a spouse had illness, or one of their kids had the illness, or the applicant even had some sort of illness that that really hurt their ability to to work or to pay their bills, or maybe the bills from the medical expenses were so high that you know some of their bills went into collections, things like that. There are a whole host of reasons unrelated to dishonesty uh, that or integrity that that somebody's credit may be negative. So I uh, I, I want to suggest to you that the only time we really recommend that an applicant use credit or an employer use credit uh, in making a hiring decision is if the individual is going to be making financial decisions on behalf of the company or the company's customers, it may make sense in those those circumstances to see how they manage their own business uh, and to try and forecast how they manage your own, yours, but you still need to look cautiously at that information. And then, of course, uh, some employers uh, do personal or professional references. There are some regulatory agencies that require personal or prof professional references, and quite honestly, all a personal reference is is a uh, an intelligence test. Is the person smart enough to list three people who are going to say nice things about them? Um, that's you know that's pretty much what it is. And what's sad is when we do these on behalf of our clients, every now and then we talk to a personal reference and they'll say, "What? He threw? He listed me?" And then they they proceed to throw the guy under the bus for the next thirty minutes. Um, so we do it, but the better way to do that whether you use your background screening company or you do it in-house, is to use those personal references, get the information from them, but then ask them to list two or three other people that have worked with this person or know this person, and hopefully they're going to list somebody, give you somebody who's not been prepped by this individual and may give you a slightly better insight into their real behavior. And again, professional references are the same kind of thing. Just because they've listed somebody uh, as somebody who knew them professionally, if the app, you know, we wouldn't have to do background checks if all your applicants were honest, right? So if they told you the truth and you could trust everything on the application, why even do the background check? The whole point of the background check is because we know that a certain percentage of them are going to lie to us. So if they're going to list somebody as a professional reference, how will you know when you've actually done the professional reference if that person really believes what they're telling you about the person or that they even worked together. So I take a lot of we, the information we get from references with a grain of salt. Then for certain positions, we will do some sort of civil litigation search to see who they've sued and who sued them. Uh, that's helpful um, in a lot of cases, especially for your executive level or senior management level positions just to kind of get a better idea how they manage their, their business and their life. And then criminal records. Of course, that's what most people think about when we talk about a background check. They're talking about a criminal background check. First thing I want to suggest is that forget everything you've ever seen on TV about criminal records or background checks. This is not CSI. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Everybody's got this idea that from TV that you know you get a fingernail clipping from somebody, drop it in a little tube connected to a computer, the machine hums for a few minutes, and then ding, it pops up on the screen with everything about this person, their their middle school math teacher, their their college roommate, the whole nine yards, and it just doesn't work that way. Um, in fact, the federal government's own criminal records database that all your fingerprint searches go through and it's what a whole host of regulatory agencies use for background checks. Um, it misses, they, they, they half their records are incomplete and they, they're missing a ton of records. They're not even sure how many because they know the states don't report everything to them and even the states, as we'll, we'll learn, don't have all the records. So let's let's talk about how records are really stored and, and what's available so maybe it makes more sense to you as to what you're getting when you order a criminal background check. First of all, most of the states do have some sort of statewide criminal records repository. Not all the states make that available to employers. Uh, California is a great example of a state that doesn't make that information available. 
Um, but even where in, sta in, in most states where it is available, it's still not reliable. You know, we're located in Texas, so we do a ton of Texas work. But what we found is that um, we ran everybody in Texas death row through DPS's database of state criminal records database, and it's missing a third of them. Um, and that's, those are people on death row. Now, they're not looking for work, so that's the good news. But the bad news is, is that we find that across the, um, um, across the, all the misdemeanors and felonies that we, uh, we find in the courthouses around the, the country, or around the state of Texas, a third of them are missing from DPS's criminal database. And that's a third of the misdemeanors and felonies. And so often we hear from employers, oh, well, I just want to make sure we, they're not an ax murderer, so I just want the big stuff. And so I'm not worried about the small stuff. Well, the reality is the way the court records are indexed is that's a moot point. Um, either they're there or they're not. There's the gaps, the holes in records availability isn't related to the size or seriousness of the offense. It's just strictly uh, you're as likely to miss um, you know, if you don't do a search right, you're as likely to miss a felony as you are a misdemeanor. Another problem with just relying on a state database is that people move around, and offenders especially, um, you know, uh, especially if they don't have strong community ties and things like that, they move around a lot. And it's not until after something's gone wrong that an employer realizes that, well, we should have done a th more thorough background check. This is Charles Clarkson. He was... Uh, arrested in Sedona, Arizona for theft from the Wildflower Inn, which is where he was hired as a manager. During the course, uh, after, after the theft had been discovered and the police were involved, uh, the police pointed out to the manager at Wildflower Inn that, well, I'm not sure why you hired this guy. He had a felony theft conviction just a few years ago uh, in Utah. And so, you know, by just searching Arizona's records, uh, this employer would have missed those Utah records altogether for felony theft, which is probably not who you're going to make your manager at, a, at your hotel motel. So a lot of employers are buying something that they call a national criminal database or a nationwide criminal records database, and there's no such thing. So if, any, if you're buying something that says na national or nationwide, they're overselling it. <laughs> it's uh, even the National Crime Information Center's database, the federal government's central criminal records maintained by the FBI. Like I said, they're missing uh, an unknown number of records, and the other half of their records that they do have are incomplete. Uh, so what happens is these companies are selling national databases. What they're doing is they're going to the states and the counties that will sell the information and buying that information and putting it into a database. So um, you're getting data from, from you know, Texas and maybe missing 30% of the records there. You're getting from some Oklahoma counties, from some Massachusetts counties maybe. And so and then there's whole states like New York that won't sell their data that way in California. So you're missing whole states. And we find, in general, about half of the records that we find at the county courthouse level show up in these so-called national databases. So they, they miss anywhere, depending on where your applicants have lived, from 40 to 60 percent of the records. And so if you're just relying on a national database, you're missing records. And here's the problem with that. Comfort Keepers is an, is an international franchise that puts people, uh, non-medical caregivers, in uh, as sitters basically to sit with the elderly or patients in hospitals and things to help them maybe at their home with light housekeeping and just kind of companionship type stuff and make sure that they eat and take their meds things like that non non medical stuff well they hired this guy Michael Gilbert he was a registered sex offender uh he was convicted in 1987 of aggravated, aggravated sexual assault of a child. It was a 12-year-old female. And he was released from parole on that offense in August of 2005. At the time, he was also on federal parole for issuing false distress signals 
He tried to fake his death, his own death at sea to get away from his sex offender registry and uh, his uh, par parole for the, you know, his other criminal offenses. And so, but so he was still on federal uh, parole, but he was on um, in uh, you know he was released from his parole from his sex offense, even though he's still a registered sex offender in August of 2005. In October of 2005, he was hired by Comfort Keepers as a sitter, and they ran a national criminal background check on him, and it disclosed no records. And then uh, he was placed to sit in an Alzheimer's care facility, and so he was hired October 23rd, and then on November 7th, just a few weeks later, a 77-year-old uh, female resident identified him as the man who sexually assaulted her. And of course, everybody sued. When the police were involved, they figured out you know, his whole history, and uh, but they couldn't prosecute him because, of course, you've got a Alzheimer's patient as a witness, and uh, it wasn't um, you know they just didn't have enough you know they couldn't put her on a stand. It was a real shame. And so everybody got sued, but at the time he basically walked away from it. Um, a couple years later, 2011, uh, he was arrested. I've been talking about this guy for, you know, at, at that point for four or five years already. And in, I opened the newspaper in 2011. Here's the same photo that I've been using in all my presentations. And he was uh, arrested in 2011 uh, for attempting to avoid arrest in another sexual assault by faking his death again. This time he kidnapped a homeless man and uh, killed him and burned him in uh, his own car, in Michael uh, Gilbert's car, to uh, hide, you know, to make it appear that he was, uh, he, he had died in his car. Another problem with these national databases is that they often uh, have incorrect information. This is Entre Knox Courage. He was convicted in 1997 for the murder of his girlfriend, and he received a life sentence. Uh, that was 97. In 2005, uh, the Innocence Project uh, proved him not guilty through DNA. And Governor Rick Perry here in Texas proclaimed him actually innocent. And you probably know Governor Perry, uh, our former governor here in Texas, he was far from a soft on crime governor. And uh, so he was proclaimed actually innocent by Governor Perry. And in January 2006, his criminal case was expunged. It no longer legally existed. You couldn't find it in the courthouse. That case was gone. That, was, that happened in January 2006. However, two years later, in March of 2008, he was terminated from his employment as a bank security guard because a private so-called national criminal database uh, revealed his his murder conviction, and uh, it was incorrect information. It was out of date, but nonetheless, he was terminated and he filed suit. Everybody settled, but this is the kind of thing we. I talked to one client, one employer who's not a client who relies exclusively on national database information, and they said as many as a third of their applicants who they aren't going to hire based on the criminal history information dispute their information with their background screening partner and uh, have it have it changed. So uh, they're full of errors, and that's why the best practice is always to go back to the original courthouse, the original source of the information, and verify it is up to date, which is what our policy is here. We won't ever deliver a, a database uh, result to a client. We always verify the information that's going back to the employer so that they can rely on the information that they're receiving from us. Another problem with databases is that they don't reflect pending cases. Um, so if somebody was just released from jail, so they lost their job one after they got arrested because they were no call, no show, so they're out looking for work and they come apply with you. If you're just relying on a database, whether it's the state database or uh, one of the so-called nationwide databases, then you're going to find you're going to miss that. And over half of the felony defendants are released uh, awaiting trial. The jails would be overflowing if we uh, didn't release people out on bail. So that's another issue, and it's something we see. We report n recent new cases uh, on applicants pretty regularly to our clients. 
So where do you get the information? If you can't rely on a single database source, where do you get it? Well, unfortunately, the only way to do it right is to go in the courthouses where that person's lived, worked, attended school, and check those live records of those courthouses. And uh, that means if they lived in Fort Worth, you go to the Tarrant County Courthouse. These are all Texas. I'm a Texas boy. I can't help but sing our praises. But if they lived in Austin, you go to the Travis County uh, Courthouse. And if they were way down in Laredo, you go to the Webb County Courthouse. Or if they were in Las Vegas, you go to the Clark County, Nevada uh, Courthouse. Or if they were in Los Angeles, you go to the dozens of courthouses in Los Angeles. And there's all kinds of ways to do it. And, and each court is different. Each county is different. But what you're ultimately going to do is check the live records of those courthouses if you want to know what really happened. Some employers say, yeah, we do county searches, but what they really do is just search the county where that person currently or where that employer is located. They just do a local county search. And like I said earlier, people move around. This guy's Jacob Muniz. His criminal history included assault on a police officer, resisting arrest, uh, aggravated robbery, and several other violent offenses down in Oasis County, Texas. But he was paroled in 2000 to Fort Worth because that's where Mama lived. And uh, almost immediately, he got a job with the Boys and Girls Club, and he ultimately was there, became their health and education director. All they did was a local county only check. They just checked Tarrant County uh, as criminal records, and so they didn't see anything about the uh, the records out in Oasis County. Well, unfortunately, he was sub subsequently convicted of sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl at the Boys and Girls Club, and certainly they wouldn't have ever let this guy in as any kind of employee, much less a director in their organization, if they had known what his history was and who he was. Another, another issue that comes up a lot is employers limit the scope of their criminal histories to seven years. And there are a lot of reasons uh, why employers think they need to do that. Some states do limit the reporting of criminal records by the background screening company to seven years. However, even in cases where reporting is limited to seven years, you really need to do at least a 10-year search because you've got to remember cases are filed and all the court, most of the court records are indexed by the date uh, when the case was filed. So if you're doing a search from uh, 10 years ago, it may be that the conviction wasn't entered until within the last seven years. And so we recommend, even if you're in a, a, a seven-year state, that we do a 10-year search. Because what happens is things like this. This is Paul Sykes, and his, his, his story will be in the notes that we'll send you out with the slides. But uh, the long and short of it is that he had a lot of convictions dating back to the 1980s for sexual assault to children. And um, he ended up, while he was working at FedEx, Kinko's, sexually assaulting some some kids he met through there, and it was just a, a, a really sad situation. FedEx Kinko's at the time was only receiving a seven-year criminal search, so his background screening company, and we know this from the court records, his background screening company even saw his all older offenses and didn't report them to FedEx Kinko's because that was their contract agreement. Another area, we've talked a lot about records that came out of the local counties and at the state level. A whole other, another, there's a whole secondary court system in this country, the federal courts. And the federal courts records are um, a completely separate system in their federal offenses. So bank robbery, interstate drug crimes, gun crimes, mail and wire fraud, child pornography. These are all things we see at the federal level. And uh, it's, only, it's less than 5% of the records that we report to our clients come out of the federal courts. They're just far fewer cases as compared to all the county courts. However, whenever a client sees a case out of a federal court, it's always something they would have wanted to know about. And if you're not running federal cases, you're eventually going to miss something significant. We see a lot more federal crimes related to drugs and uh, uh, weapons crimes than just probably just about anything else. So what does a good background check look like? Let's summarize that. It starts with that identity research. 
and then we'll run those state and national databases as kind of a safety net. We don't call it a national database. We call it a multi-jurisdictional database because, again, I don't want to oversell the value of it. But um, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good safety net to put you know, anything that comes out of those databases. We go ahead and verify at the county where that record uh, initiated. And then you also want to do research in each county where they've lived, worked, attended school for the last 10 years. And then you want to search those federal court records as well. And those all end up in your report. So that is a, a reliable, thorough criminal history. Now, what I really want to stress to you, though, is that all the background check is going to do, whether it's employment verifications, criminal history, whatever, it's just going to catch the low-hanging fruit. It's going to catch those people who've been identified either by the criminal justice system or by a former employer as being a knucklehead, somebody who, you, you know, has got some issues and you may or may not want to hire into your organization because of those, those past decisions they've made. But you've got to have all your other business c controls in place. Too often I talk to organizations where their only real con you know, people control about you know, making people behave right is, is in their hiring process. And you can have a great hiring process, but people's circumstances change. And given the right opportunity, there are people out there who would do something bad to you. And um, so you've got to have all your other business controls in place, whether it's financial or, you know, child sex, sexual abuse awareness training, uh, financial controls, uh, safety training, you name it. All those other things need to be in place. Just relying on the background check by itself uh, will get you in trouble eventually. A couple things here in the, at the end of the webinar I just want to touch on. We've got whole webinars that cover these topics, but the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act is, what, is the single thing that is most likely to get you sued if you're an employer running background checks. It's, um, we, we're seeing a lot of, uh, of, of lawsuits, class action lawsuits, based on failure to follow with the FCRA, the FCRA, and it's a really easy law to comply with. The first thing that the law requires of employers is that you disclose to the applicant that you're going to procure the background check, and that disclosure is going to be on a separate document used exclusively for that purpose. So you can't have releases of liability or things like that in the document. Then they have to give you written authorization to procure the background check. And so you have to make disclosure to them, hey, we're going to order a background check. Under the law, it's called a consumer report. And then... Um, you've got to get their signed authorization before you order the background check. And there are lawsuits out there. Uh, there's a $5.9 million lawsuit, again, uh, judgment, or actually it's class action settlement um, for $5.9 million by first, uh, first Student, which is owned by First, first America, which is a, they operate bus, school buses in, in school districts all over the country. $5.9 million because they weren't making the appropriate disclosures and getting the appropriate authorizations from applicants. And these were some of these applicants who were suing them were people who they actually hired. They didn't lose a job opportunity because of, of this. These were just simply people who they, they, they their, their rights under the law were violated, so they were able to sue even if they didn't have any actual damages. Domino's Pizza settled a case for $2.5 million dollars in uh, March of 2013, and again, it was, uh, uh, this time, in this case, Domino's had a release of liability in their disclosure document, just like two or three sentences that were your general, you know, release of liability, probably one of their attorneys told them to put it in there, because that's the other problem, is a lot of your employment law attorneys aren't really familiar with the ins and outs of, of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, so I see a lot of things that have been attorney-blessed that are just wrong under the FCRA. And then there's a whole host of lawsuits filed in the last couple of years against everybody, uh, you know, uh, every industry you can think of. Uh, Whole Foods is one of the big ones out there. It was filed last year. And then once you get your report back, okay, you got their authorization, you ordered the background check from your, your background screening partner, and, and now the results are coming back. And once you get the report back, if there's anything that may result in an adverse action, you've got, a, you've got certain responsibilities. And that means not hiring them. If you're not going to hire them based on the report, or you're going to offer them a different position or less pay, you name it. If it's from the point of view of the applicant, it's an adverse uh, action, then just assume that it's adverse and that all of, all of this kicks in. 
And what it means is, before you take that action, you've got to give them a copy of their report and a copy of their rights under the law. And that's uh, those two documents. In our system, they're built right in, and, and our system will print it out or even email it to the applicant for you, uh, or email the applicant a link where they can come retrieve the information securely, but or to print the letters out and you just drop them in the mail. But that's you need to make sure you've got a process in place before you make the decision not to hire them. So you don't want to call them and tell them, we're not going to hire you, we've got your background check back. What you want to do is say, we've got your background check back, I'm, we're, we're mailing you a copy of it with a copy of your rights. When you get that, let us know and, and we'll, um, we'd like to have a conversation with you about that. The other thing we do, when we do this on behalf of our clients, and a lot of our clients do have us do this for them, is we send this first letter, this first piece of information here, certified mail and regular mail. This is probably me just being a suspenders and belt kind of guy, but we send them both uh, ways because um, I, don't want the, I want them to get the information as quickly as possible, so I send it regular mail, uh, but I send it certified as well so that they will have to sign for it. And they may not be able to get down to the post office until the following weekend or whatever, but at least I'm getting them to sign for it. So we've got documentation that they actually did receive it. Then once they have received that copy of their report and their rights, then the employer's got to take another, make another notice and tell them about, you know, we're taking this action. So you've received your information, so we're making the decision now. We're not going to hire you. And so you, there has to be a letter that, uh, and it can be verbal, but I don't imagine how you, any of you want to do this verbally. I'd recommend against it. Um, but you got to tell them that we're, we're sending our offer, or we're not making this offer, or we're eliminating you from consideration based in whole or part on this background check. And there's other things in there about you got to tell them how to contact the background screening agency and that the background screening agency didn't have anything to do with making the employment decision. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's got to be technically in this letter. And again, our online system will print it out for you. Many, uh, many uh, screening companies have a similar process. Not following these notice requirements, though, will get you sued as well. Walt Disney Company was, was sued and uh, had a class action against them in November of 2013. And that case is ongoing, but it was strictly the allegations are just strictly that um, Walt Disney wasn't following the adverse action requirements. And um, if you'll you'll see the across the bottom there is a link to the uh, the our blog article about the the Walt Disney case, and it'll be in the notes as well. The other thing you need to know is this this is the law that makes things disappear from your credit report after seven years. Likewise, uh, it, this law limits what employers can be told by their background screening company. And so the, sh the short version is that criminal convictions under federal law, if it's an actual conviction, are reportable forever. And non-convictions are only reportable for seven years. But we have a whole webinar that goes through all the details of what employers' responsibilities are under the FCRA. And I really, it's recorded on our website. You can go look at it at any time. But it's also scheduled for the spring if you want to watch it for HRCI-related credit. There are state consumer reporting laws as well. We won't get into a lot of those because we're running short on time. But um, you'll, they'll be in the notes for you. And Texas and several other states have specific requirements that have been superseded by federal law. And so you need to know that that if, just because they have that restriction doesn't mean it's valid because the federal law may have, have uh, superseded it. And then there's California. California has a whole host of limitations on what employers can can do. They used to be the 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 worst state for for this stuff, and I think Massachusetts is a close second now. And there are state consumer reporting laws for the use of uh, credit reports as well. At least 10 states have limitations on how employers can use credit in making hiring decisions. Most of them deal with job relatedness. And then there's the ban the box movement. And you're probably familiar with this. If you're in HR, you've probably seen this happening around the country. Some states and a whole bunch of municipalities have uh, limited the uh, employer's ability to ask about a, uh, an applicant's criminal history in, on the application document. Most states, most of these states that are adopting Man the Box, and I think there's like uh, maybe 13 states, something like that now, that have banned the box and over 60 um, 
municipalities have their own little local ordinances, and most of them prevent you from asking about somebody's criminal history until after you've done an interview. And then some states, like Hawaii, prohibit the uh, the inquiry until after you've made an offer. And we've got a whole webinar just on that topic. It's become such a hot topic, and and it's really about how to what you know the what a good criminal history inquiry on your application or a later document will contain and look like, as well as some of the, the state-specific considerations you want to pay attention to. And finally, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. We've all heard about the uh, EEOC's concerns about the use of criminal history and how it may have a, a disparate impact on minorities. We've got a whole webinar on this topic as well. The important thing to know is what you want to do is evaluate the risks associated with a particular position and the related uh, offenses that would give you pause. Uh, if, if this offense happened uh, in the last you know, five years, seven years, something like that, does it create a, a real risk to put this person in the specific job? Those are called the green factors and uh, like from the Green versus Missouri Pacific case. Like I said, we've got a whole webinar on that topic. But the bottom line is you don't want a question like this on your employment application. Have you ever been arrested? And if yes, just deposit your application in the trash can on your way out. And you don't want things on your on your uh, job postings like this either, though. Clean background check required, no felonies allowed, no convictions for theft or dishonesty. Those are all red flags, and you're inviting uh, an EEOC inquiry and uh, probably eliminating candidates that you probably, you know, would otherwise be qualified and you'd be interested in. The EEOC did publish a whole guidance on this in April of 2012, and we've got a whole webinar that goes through developing a matrix so you know what your policy is like, what your policy is going to be before you ever uh, create, uh, before you ever run your first background check, or it makes it real easy to, if you've got this process in place, uh, to know for this particular position, this person is eligible, they're a Y they're not eligible because it's kind of offense, or they're C, there's some sort of corporate review. We're going to get more details on it. Like I said, we've got two webinars on this topic, one about the EEOC guidance and one about create, creating that criminal history evaluation tool so you know in advance what, the, um, what kind of items would be of concern to you with regard to somebody's criminal history for a specific kind of job. And finally, identity theft is happening out there obviously and what happens is sometimes is when somebody has had their identity when somebody has stolen another person's identity when they get arrested the police think they're the they're the they can the police confuse them with the actual person who committed the identity theft and so all that to say is very inarticulately um, the the identity theft victim's name gets associated with the defendant's criminal records. And so this is right out of our files. This is a true case out of our files. This guy was um, came to us as an applicant, and he uh, was uh, with a large social services organization here in Fort Worth, one of our crown jewels of our Fort Worth uh, uh, community. And uh, he was going to become, become a, a senior level uh, social worker for them. And we ran his background check, and the national database spit out that he had records here in, in Berkeley, South Carolina, and in Navarro County, Texas. So that was a red flag for us because his employment history during all these times from 96 to the early 2000s had, was consistent. He was always employed, and it was always locally. So we didn't have information about him even being in these other areas. And so, our, you know, but the problem was is. He had a really, really unique name, um, and you know, think about Ebediah Ezekiel Uriah Jones. I mean, a really unique name that you're not going to have. It's very unlikely that you're going to have two people with that really unique name and date of birth running around out there. So we ordered. It was a red flag for us. So before we said anything to our client, we ordered copies from the court's records, court, copies of court documents. We also ordered mug shots to see if you know what this this guy actually looked like. And then we called our client, and, I, and I, I made the call and said, so tell me about this applicant. And uh, 
the client said, well, uh, he's well respected in the industry and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, no, I understand that. But um, tell me, describe him physically to me. And the client said, well, he's about a six foot two black guy. And I said, well, no, that's not our guy. <laughs> and as it turned out, I, I later talked to the applicant about it. And in fact, he, his identity had been stolen in the early 1990s. Somebody had opened some checking accounts in his name and some other things. And when he was in the military, he had been in South Carolina. And uh, that's where this all happened. So what's apparently happened is this guy on your screens ident stole the identity of our applicant and has been and used it when he got first, when he was first con uh, arrested. He gave that identity information. And now his fingerprints are associated with our applicants. So every time he gets in trouble someplace, our applicants' information pops up. And so there's more about that in the store, in the notes. But just so uh, the whole point of that is to tell you that when an applicant tells you that's not me, most of the time they're pulling your chain, but sometimes they may be telling you the truth. So make sure that you connect them with their the background screening company so that they can dispute it, and the background screening company will, will reinvestigate that information. So let's go through our questions now. Uh, Heidi says, I thought we weren't allowed to ask for SSN until after hire. That's not actually the case. Um, um, a lot of, you know, that's one of those things that's out there. The reason you don't want to ask for it, SSN early, if you don't have to, is just because it's a piece of data, you know, it's a very sensitive piece of information, and, if, you know, employers are always worried about losing it. But you can ask for information that you need in order to do appropriate due diligence. Um, and so you can ask for even date of birth. That's the one that you hear most often, so you can't ask about date of birth. Uh, pre-employment. Well, you can, and in order to do the background check, you, you have to. The um, and there's no law that says you can. The concern with asking about for DOB is that you'll the, the you know you'll have their age, and that you may face an age discrimination claim. That's the theoretical reason. I've never, in all my years heard of anybody being accused of age discrimination based on the fact that they were asking for a DOB early in the process. I don't want I don't I don't want you to go around out there and put it on your employment application, but in that this consumer report disclosure form that that FCRA required document, you can certainly put it there so the applicant puts their date of birth there and their social. And then you can separate that document from the rest of the employment application so you don't have an employment application with a dates of birth and social security numbers floating around your organization. So just keep those documents separately, or if you've got an electronic application, make sure that only people with a real need to know that information has access to it. Let's see what our other questions are. Uh, will we get the slides as well as the audio? Yes, there will be a, uh, we'll send out a survey uh, later this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning. And at the end of the survey, which just basically asks how I did today, uh, there will be a link to download the, the slides and notes and, and to watch the recording if you need to share it with anybody. Or if this was just so awesome you want to do it again. I'm confused about sending adverse action letters. I've been told that because we are sending them from the corporate office, we were okay to send the pre-adverse action and adverse action letter at the same time. I don't understand how this allows us to be still in compliance. You're right, it doesn't, Linda. Um, yeah, you definitely cannot send those two things separately. You need to send the pre-adverse action letter first and make sure the applicant has had an opportunity to receive that information. And then you send the adverse action letter after the fact. You do the the law really wants to see the three steps. You send the pre adverse action information, then you make and after they've received it, you make your decision. And that decision, if it's adverse to the consumer, you send them the second notice, the adverse action letter, where you actually explain to them this is the action we're taking based in whole on the part on the report. So you want those to be three distinct steps. And uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Let me see what else. Is there anything else? No. Those, any other questions? If not, uh, I appreciate everybody sticking with us through this webinar today. And if um, well, you'll, you'll get a survey later on with, with after you complete the survey, you'll get all the HRCI and SHRM uh, credit information. 
Uh, and as always, if you're not already one of our clients I, and you don't absolutely love your background screening company, I hope you'll uh, give us a call. That's what we do, and we've got clients, you know, our whole issue is we're, we're the background screening company for, for employers who can't afford to do it wrong. If you've got to get it done right, we're your guys. If you want customer service and easy-to-use software system, that's what we do. Um, you call us, and there's you're not going to get uh, you know a customer service desk in Thailand or India. You're going to actually talk to somebody right here in Fort Worth, Texas, who can answer your question or get you an answer real quick. Um, and likewise, every one of my employer clients have my cell. Now you do too. And the reason I, I put my cell out there is because employers really, our clients rarely have to use it. So you can call me at two in the morning if you want to but it just doesn't happen because we take care of our clients up front. So if I can ever be of service, give me a call, and uh, I hope you'll – we're also doing a webinar on Friday um, about reductions in force in the Warren Act with Lon Williams. And so if – especially our oil and gas clients, uh, this one's really for you because I know a lot of number, number of them are cutting production significantly right now. And uh, so that's why we're offering that one if – if it's of service, I hope you'll join us for that one. Thank you, everybody, and I hope uh, you have a great rest of your week.